<laughs> and yep. welcome back to the second part of Look Where You Tread. Yep. Right, well, this, this time I'm wanting to look at the floor as it reflects spaces and features in the church and what the floors are actually used for. Something we often see without noticing is the way that the floors, either by steps or changes of height or by patterning, mark off areas with different functions within the building. From the earliest churches, the floors provided a means of delineating the extent of sacred spaces. So here in the 8th century chapel of the Theotokos at Wadi Ain al Kaisa in Jordan, the holiest area containing the altar is clearly fenced off both by steps and a broad band of elaborate patterning. The area outside the barrier, allocated to the laity, has mosaics reflecting the secular world and a dedicatory inscription. Again here, the pavement of the apse of the Church of St. Stephen at Umar Arasas, again in Jordan, makes the division between the holy area around the altar from the more worldly area for the laity crystal clear. The sanctuary decoration is purely abstract, while the nave mosaic represents the world and its concerns. Moving back to Britain, frequently as the level rises marked out by steps, as the nature of the building moves from secular to sacred. Here in St Justin Penwith, the distinction between chancel and sanctuary is marked with two solid granite steps. Again in Brant Broughton in Lincolnshire, the transition is marked with two steps up from the nave to the chancel, the area for the clergy, and another two up into the sanctuary, the area reserved for the priestly functions of Eucharist and blessing. Here at Alwinton in Northumberland, the flight of chancel steps makes a very, very emphatic difference distinction between the realms of clergy and laity. While the height of the stairs is dictated by the presence of a crypt under the chancel, coupled with the steep hillside on which it's built, it serves to make the sanctity of the altar blindingly obvious. While in most churches changes of level are clearly planned and significant, in a few they seem to be utterly random. In Holy Trinity Goodrum Gate in York, you need to be constantly on the lookout for steps up and down between various areas of the church, with little obvious rhyme or reason. The southeast chapel, seen here, is at the original floor level, while other parts of the church seem to have been built up to various different levels over the centuries. It's a constant look where you tread in, in Holy Trinity. In St Andrews, East Heslerton, this division is achieved by differing patterns of Minton tiles. The sanctuary tile patterns get more elaborate the closer they get to the altar. And the distinction between the static space of the choir and the processional route down the chancel is also clearly marked. In the chancel of Studley Royal, each step is made of a different type of marble, increasing in cost as the altar is approached. Here too, the floor of the chancel identifies this clerical area as the New Jerusalem and the path up the chancel can be seen as a version of the Via Dolorosa. And an inscription on the chancel step makes the significance clear and invites the godly to enter. I sometimes wonder if the florists of Helmsley bought a job lot of remainder Minton tiles and then set out to make the best of a curiously assorted bunch of patterns. I find it highly entertaining the way that the choir floor is outlined on three sites with what appears to be modern trip, trip hazard tape. This doesn't always perform its function, as various shaken conductors can attest, as they step back out of the chancel. Sometimes floors give an indication of what has gone. Here at the east end of the North Island in Helmsley, the tiling takes a curious bend from the line of the aisle. This is because there used to be a small altar here with a reredos behind it, which, behind which Sunday school used to meet. I'd wondered about this for ages. I finally found somebody who was brought up in Helmsley and was able to tell me that when she was a child, there had been a Lady Chapel altar there. A Durham, a medieval pavement, survives on the platform where St Cuthbert's Shrine stood. Their layout of the first phase of sandstone paving stones preserves the apsidal form of the original East End, dating from the 1090s. 
The platform was enlarged and squared up when the chapel of nine altars replaced the original east end. The additional paving stones are smaller and slightly paler, though still formed of the same sandstone. It would seem that the original stones were deemed too holy to just replace, so they added on to them. Also in Durham, we find a stone line across the west end of the nave, which marks the extent of the Galilee area of the great monastic church. This was the area where women were allowed to attend worship. East of this line was men only. We now move on to a very specialist form of flooring, which was probably found at one time or another in all our great cathedral and abbey churches. The tracing floor, a smooth plaster floor on which elements of the design were worked out by the masons before producing patterns to work from. The master mason's true skill was a knowledge of geometry, and medieval illustrations usually show them with a set square, plumb line and dividers. Great buildings like cathedrals were not designed using maths, but rules of proportion such as the golden section or Fibonacci numbers. Mathematically, these numbers are difficult to comprehend, being based on the square root of whole numbers. However, using arcs and lines, the geometry is easy to construct. Once the overall design had been established, setting out would begin. Elements of the building would be inscribed full-sized on great polished plaster floors, and full-sized timber or metal templates would be made for the carved sections of stone. In England, two of these survive one at York Minster and the other in Wells Cathedral. Both are so placed in the building that it's difficult to see them as being workshops, but rather the medieval equivalent of a modern architect's design office, where details could be worked out and possibly templates made. One thing that characterises both these floors is they're high up in the building with good north light illumination. This would give good, long-lasting light, while the designers were also well out of the way of the general life of the cathedral. In York Minster, above the ceiling of the passage from the north transept to the chapter house, the tracing floor is in a well-lit L-shaped room now known as the Mason's Loft, dating from the 1290s. It has been suggested it was originally intended as a library, but it's clear that it was never used for anything but as a tracing house. For much of the north-south wing of the space, the original floor, plaster floor survives more or less intact. On, it, on this floor can be seen traces of the original construction drawing. A drawing of the floor made in 1968 shows, among other drawings, a layout identified as for the mid 14th century windows in the Lady Chapel. Templates made from these drawings were normally cut out of thin wooden boards, but might also be made of thin sheets of metal. That the mason's loft went on being used for this purpose is suggested by the large numbers of wooden, iron and zinc templates hanging in bundles from the walls and from racks, which probably belonged to the late 18th and 19th centuries. At the upper level of the north porch of Wells Cathedral, lit by an elegant triple lancet window, is the tracing floor. It seems originally to have been constructed to be a vestry for clergy, participating in ceremonies on the upper level of the cathedral, such as the Palm Sunday liturgy. But this idea seems to have been abandoned as the work needed to make it functional was never completed. This left the room available to the Masons, and it may have been used for the construction of the chapter house in 1249. Photogrammetry work was carried out in 2016, enabling the picking out of individual designs by enhancing the initial scans. And you can see how from looking at the general and unenhanced scans, you can't see the moulding patterns. When you look at the bottom picture where, where the arrow is pointing, you can see the scan of a very elaborate moulding picked out. This enabled the design, identification of designs for the vaulted ceiling of the East Cloister. You can see them uh, picked out in red on the plan. What is clear is that both these spaces, from both these spaces, as they were carefully constructed, well out of the way in a location that would not compromise the progress of the building works and with the aim of maximizing available light. They must have constituted something of a refuge for the overworked master mason. It took serious intent to go and seek these places out. Now move to another 
for specialist floor item, a labyrinth. A labyrinth is a maze with only one path and no element of choice. There were popular motifs during the Roman period, and it was not long before they found their way onto church floors, both mosaic, tile, and stone. This is a linear B inscribed tab clay tablet from Pylos in Greece with a labyrinth on its reverse. Dating to about 1200 BC, it's the only known occurrence of the labyrinth symbol in the Minoan and Mycenaean world, where the word labyrinth is first recorded. Linear B texts from Knossos on Crete refer to the lady of the labyrinth to whom offerings are made. The Mycenaean form for labyrinth, dabarito, can be compared with the Hebrew word debir, used for the Holy of Holies of Solomon's temple in which the Ark was preserved. This suggests a meaning for the word of an almost inaccessible sacred space, perhaps a kind of cult place, cave or building that provided a secret inaccessible recess. The foundation myth from which the idea of labyrinth comes is the Greek story of Theseus and the Minotaur. The wife of King Minos fell madly in love with a bull and as a result gave birth to the Minotaur. He had the head of a bull and a man's body. Minos locked this monster in a prison built by the architect Daedalus called the Labyrinth. There were so many meanders that it was impossible for the Minotaur to find the exit. Every nine years, seven young men and seven young girls were sent as a sacrifice to Crete. One year, Theseus, Prince of Athens, was among the young men sent for sacrifice. Arriving in Crete, he met Ariadne, the daughter of Minos, who fell in love with him. Knowing what to expect, she gave him a spool of thread so he could unroll it in the labyrinth and follow it back. Theseus found the Minotaur, killed him, and found his way in the labyrinth, thanks to the unwound spool. And the story is shown, this story is shown on this late 3rd century mosaic floor in Paphos. Labyrinths come in three main forms. They evolve from early spiral forms via the circular Cretan form, where the path goes round the full circle before bending back on itself. The square Roman form, where the path progresses one quadrant at a time. To the chart or church labyrinth, which is something between the two. The labyrinth of St. Reparata of El Aznam in Algeria is now in Algiers Cathedral, and it's the earliest surviving church labyrinth, and not really very like early other examples. It's unmistakably Roman and was originally laid down in 324 CE. Unique to this object, in the labyrinth's centre, it seems to be something like a crossword puzzle, but this is actually a palindrome of Santa Ecclesia, Holy Church. This means that no matter how one reads this phrase, be it forwards or backwards, vertically or horizontally, it will always say the same thing. So, use those paths, those paths. With the phrase Santa Ecclesia, replacing the figures of Theseus and the Minotaur at the heart of the labyrinth, this early Christian maze is an assertion that while the journey to the center is perilous, the reward for reaching it is not death, but eternal life the word square at the centre of the labyrinth. Our next labyrinth only survives in part at the Basilica of San Michele in Pavia and has been dated to the early 12th century. That it survives at all can be attributed to the builders of a large altar in the 16th century, who simply erected the altar on top of it and replaced the rest of the mosaic with a very smart stone floor. When the altar was moved in 1972, this expanse of mosaic was a revealed underneath. When we add what survives where the altar stood to the part of the composition recorded in the 17th century as mounted on the interior wall of the church, now lost, we can produce a reconstruction something like this. In the middle, Theseus battles with a monster in a labyrinth surrounded by four strange creatures. Above is a personification of the year surrounded by the 12 months and to one side, David vanquishes Goliath. Here it seems that Theseus represents Christ coming into the world to vanquish sin and David foreshadowing that. Probably not from a floor at all, this 12th century stone found in the church of Pontremoli near Lucca, whose original positioning is unknown and it provides a very different interpretation of the symbol. Two riders facing each other appear to be fighting above the labyrinth, the path of which has been engraved rather than the walls. 
In the centre, we see the monogram of Christ, IHS, and on the periphery, this curious inscription, Run to Win. This seems to be the end of a quotation from Paul. Do you not know that those who run in the stadium all run, but only one wins the prize? Run to win it. Obviously, the prize to which the inscription refers can only be Christ. The path indicated then becomes a means of reaching through the vicissitudes of a world tainted by sin to the eternal glory proceeding from the risen Christ. Again, not on a floor, but a similar date to the Pavia Labyrinth, is this extraordinary wall painting in the church of St. Francis in Alatri in Italy, which came to light during restorations in 1997. Its unique iconography with Christ in glory at the heart of the labyrinth was perhaps designed to remind the observer that if you keep on going, even if you seem to be walking away from him, the Christian way leads you to Christ and a share in his victory. But probably the best known and best preserved church labyrinth is that at Church Cathedral. This labyrinth is definitely contemporary with the pavement of the cathedral and part of the original building programme. It may have been created as soon as the pillars of the nave were built, around 1200, or once the main structural work was complete, about 1215. The contours of the labyrinth were inlaid into the stone paving of the nave in a dark stone, probably coming from the Ardennes near Givet. This must have been a very complex operation, the study of the placing of the joints shows that a relatively small number of templates were used. After this, the 272 white stones which formed the path had to be worked at the local quarry that served the rest of the building. These are of irregular size, suggesting that some of them have been broken and replaced. Around the edge, there are 113 teeth and a six-lobed rose occupies the centre. Originally, a brass plate covered the, much of the centre with an engraving of Theseus and the Minotaur, but this is now lost, but you can see where it was. Like all medieval labyrinths, the Chartres one is entered from the west, so that as you head into it, you're looking towards the high altar in the east, the direction from which Christ would come on the last day. The Chartres labyrinth is the only survivor of a number of such large floor labyrinths that were created during the 13th and 14th centuries, in the cathedrals of France. These included that at Auxerre, and it's from Auxerre that an amazing account survives of its liturgical use during the 14th century. On Easter Monday, the dean, wearing his almis, received the ball, which we know from another document of 1412 was yellow in colour, not excessively large, but too large to hold with one hand, from a recently appointed canon, while the other clergy began to sing the prose scheduled for the day of Easter, which begins, Victime Pascali Laudes, praise of the Paschal victim. The, the dean then clasped the ball in his left hand against his chest under the almis and started to dance a measure in three time on the repeated notes of the sung prose. The rest of the clergy joined hands and they began a dance round the maze. During this, at different times, the ball was passed or thrown to one or more of the singers. The lively dance carried on, the rhythm being also given by the organ. When the dance, both music and leaping steps were completed, the choir would hurry off to their meal. Similar games are recorded from many of these cathedrals, though not in such detail. It is implied that the leader entering the labyrinth with the sun ball hidden until he reached the centre, represented the figure of Christ dying to the world as he entered the labyrinth, and then revealing his new life and transmitting it to his church as the ball was thrown to and fro among them. A chart, an ordinance of 1366, deals with La Fête des Fous, April Fool's Day, and it is expressly abolished. We will only keep, it adds, the game of the Bishop and the Children of the Dawn, in which only children shall take part, and the song that is called Correa, the dance, a song accustomed at Easter time. And these two uses, the chapter will tolerate them as long as it sees fit. This strongly suggests a ritual similar to that of Auxerre. A chapter of purification in 1452 forbade, without debate, any dancing during the day and the week of Easter. The whole chapter are ordered to avoid the dance which is used to being held at Easter, or to strike somebody during the week of the same celebration, whether in the nave, the choir, or elsewhere. We well, don't forbid what's not happening. 
It's also interesting that the labyrinth at Auxerre itself was destroyed in the 17th century by a clergy who found the noise of children playing the labyrinth too distracting during the service. This picture shows a dance which took place in Chartres Labyrinth during the Easter Vigil in 2013. It's been suggested that the institutional church of the 1215s in the ecclesiastical province of Saint, which included the Bishopric of Chartres, made an astonishing choice to integrate into its worship practices foreign to the official liturgies to give more scope and symbolic content to the liturgical ceremony. The Chartres Labyrinth was not a tool for individual devotion, but the only trace in the form of marking on the ground of an original liturgy specific to a few cathedrals at Easter Day with an ambitious aim to visually share the grace of the risen Christ and open his path in heaven, to heaven for his worshippers. This is another photograph of the 2013 Easter Vigil. Amiens had another fine 13th century labyrinth, similar in scale to that of Chartres, but octagonal. It was created in 80, 1288, about a century after the original building. Unfortunately, in 1825, it was destroyed in a burst of post-revolutionary fervour. It was restored in 1894, including a reconstruction of the central plaque commemorating the architects of the original cathedral. The original matrix for this is now in the museum. Set among the 6th century mosaics in the San Vitale Basilica in Ravenna is a 16th century labyrinth, an unusually late medieval example. It was installed in 1583 after a series of floods damaged an earlier floor mosaic. The idea of this labyrinth seems to be somewhat different from other examples. At the centre of the 11 foot wide circle is a circle of black and white marble, possibly symbolising the world or human nature. From this, a path is clearly marked with arrow-like triangles moving out from the centre and reaching outside the circular form to reach a scallop shell, possibly the symbol of pilgrimage, but more likely that of baptism. The labyrinth is just walkable, but it seems likely that it was there to be looked at and shows the complex path from birth to new life. After the medieval period, there was little interest in church labyrinths until they saw something of a revival in the 19th century. Ideas about the meaning of the labyrinth had changed and it was now seen as a substitute for a pilgrimage. The pilgrim entered the labyrinth and walked meditatively and prayerfully to Jerusalem at its centre. This idea stands out in the south portal of the Basilica of St. Servatius in the Dutch city of Maastricht. Here, the late 19th century tiled floor shows a labyrinth with Maastricht centre front as its starting point, which leads via Aachen, Cologne, Rome and Constantinople at the four corners to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem at the centre. An unusual Victorian tiled labyrinth can be found in the apsidal chancel of St Mary's Itch and Stoke, now maintained by the Church's Conservation Trust. Built in 1866, the church was designed by the architect Henry Conybeare. His design for St Mary's was clearly inspired by the Saint-Chapelle in Paris, and it has also been suggested that the chapel at Exeter College, built in 1856-59 to the design by Gilbert Scott was also influential. Covered with glazed tiles, the floor is laid in the form of a labyrinth. Though it's usually difficult to appreciate the full design because the wooden altar table stands in the middle of it. When it was new, it was described as a modified reproduction in glazed green and chocolate tiles of one of the concentric labyrinths called heavenly Jerusalems that so frequently occur in the pavement of early French cathedrals. Its appropriateness for a chancel is strange. The labyrinth in St Michael's Abingdon is based on a drawing in an early 11th century copy of Boethius, produced at Abingdon Abbey. The illustration of a six-path, seven-wall labyrinth contains a poem, Sumter est Maria rad celestia, alleluia, Mary is assumed into heaven, alleluia, which can be read in either of two ways, either by following the path of the labyrinth, which gives one arrangement of lines, or according to the circles, which gives you a different combination. As part of a major refurbishment, the labyrinth was dedicated on the 25th of January 2009. The design is of a six-circuit, four-fold style with seven walls, symbolising the sevenfold heaven referred to in the prayer accompanying the original illustration. 
St. Mary's Church, Barnard Castle, installed its labyrinth that same year, 29. Located in a side chapel, it's a five ring octagonal form executed in polished wood flooring and is used as an aid for medita personal meditation. The labyrinth in Mo Boxgrove Priory in Sussex was installed in 2008 as part of a major restoration of this former monastic church, which now serves as a parish church for the village of Boxgrove. The parish priest commissioned a local artist to design the labyrinth, which is based on a turf labyrinth in the area, and it's made out of Purbeck stone. Unusually, one Methodist church in England has installed a labyrinth floor. This is Chislehurst Methodist Church. It has areas to create worship displays and interactive stations. This makes it very versatile. It can be used for simply walking as an individual, as an educational space to fit in school RE curriculum, a sacred space on retreat days, or to use with prayers during worship. Photos of the Ch Chislehurst Labyrinth under construction. The setting out tools are not really very different from those the medieval master craftsmen would have used. More recently, the labyrinth has become the image of believers' earthly life, turned in the direction of God who awaits everyone at the end of a demanding but unambiguous journey. Various ideas about the labyrinth are mixed up in modern spirituality. Some schools of thought see it as the expression of secret knowledge and accessible only to initiates. These people talk a lot about numbers and measures and the Templars, New Age. New Age and Oriental spirituality see it as a tool for personal fulfillment, insisting on the need to find oneself while it can be seen as a therapeutic process aimed at the acceptance of the personality, especially in its most vulnerable aspects. It's come an awfully long way from Theseus. In Bologna's Basilica of San Petronio, a disc of light moves across the cathedral floor from a hole in the roof of the church, which is surrounded by a halo of golden rays painted to resemble the sun. At solar noon, when the sun has reached its highest point in the sky, the circle of light touches a long straight line made of inlaid bronze and brass and copper, nearly 220 feet from end to end. The line is a long diagonal slash, cutting it between two columns, totally at odds with the building's floor plan. This is a meridian, essentially a large indoor sundial. The Basilica of St Mary and the Angels and the Martyrs is built inside the ruins of the Roman Baths of Diocletian in Rome, and was constructed in the 16th century following an original design by Michelangelo, though other architects and artists added to the church over the following centuries. At the beginning of the 18th century, Pope Clement IX commissioned the, astro the astronomer, mathematician, archaeologist, historian and philosopher Francesco Bianchini to build a meridian line within the basilica. Completed in 1702, the object had a threefold purpose. The Pope wanted to check the accuracy of the Gregorian Reformation of the calendar, to produce a tool to predict Easter exactly, and not least to give Rome a meridian line as important as the one Giovanni Domenico Cassini had recently built in Bologna's cathedral, San Petronio. This diagram of Bianchini's meridian from his De Calendario shows how it works. The ray on the right comes through a small hole beneath the papal coat of arms from the sun and hits the line at solar noon throughout the year. The ray on the left, coming through another hole in the wall, is from the pole star and moves around the circle on the floor once a day. The meridian line is of light coloured marble set into a stunning opus sectile floor and surrounded by sections showing the zodiac together with metal plaques denoting various church feasts. The hole in the church's wall from which the sun can shine onto the meridian line. The sun's image is projected onto this line just before solar noon here about 11.54 in late October. The earliest surviving meridian however is in San Petronio, Bologna. The first meridian line at Bologna was installed by an artisan and Dominican cartographer named Ignacio Danti in 1575. However, when the church was enlarged in 1653, a wall was displaced fatally undermining the meridian's function. Almost immediately, the Jesuit astronomer and engineer Giovanni Domenico Cassini was brought in to repair, extend and substantially improve on Dante's work, 
and in 1655 he began work on the Meridian Line that we still see today in Bologna. With the exception of repairs performed in 1695 and again in 1776, the device remains true to his original design. His floor pan and engravings of San Petronio Bologna show how difficult it was to fit the line into the building. As it is, the line shaves the sides of, the, of two of the pillars before ending abruptly at the west wall of the church. High on the roof of the notional north aisle, the church actually follows the lie of the land and runs roughly north, northeast, south, southwest, so it's not actually a north aisle. A tiny hole has been made to let the beam of sunlight, which allows the meridian line to function. Looking down the meridian line, you can see quite what a squeeze it is to get the line in. Slight subsidence over the centuries means that the light no longer runs directly down the centre of the line. And here you can see how squeezed it tight it is. It really is a tight fit. And just above the main door of the church, you can see a tiny and perilous little ledge on the windowsill. This is Cassini's seat. It's aligned to the meridian, and it was here that he sat to lay out the line with accuracy. Sooner him than me. Oop. A somewhat later meridian and gnomon was installed in the church of St. Sulpice in, in Paris at the initiative of Jean Baptiste Langue de Gergi, the Paris parish priest from 1714 to 1748. He initially wished to establish the exact astronomical time in order to ring the bells at the most appropriate time of day, and commissioned the, commissioned the English clockmaker Henry Sully to build it. Two small holes in the window provide access for the sunlight. The upper one during the summer, when the image of the sun is projected onto the line along the floor, and the lower for the winter, when the image is projected onto the obelisk against the opposing wall. As befits a product of the Enlightenment, this is a much plainer installation than the Baroque ones of Rome and Bologna. Inscriptions at the base of the obelisk, somewhat defaced during the French Revolution, record the scientific uses to which the meridian was put, as well as establishing the exact astronomical time in order to ring the bells at the right time. It was also used to properly define the Easter equinox, establish the mutation changes of the Earth's axis and the obliquity of the ecliptic, and to determine the date of the Earth's perihelion, the moment the Earth is closest to the sun in its elliptical trajectory around the sun. So this was very much a scientific instrument rather than a devotional one. Closer to home is the cloister at Durham Cathedral. As you walk past, it's easy to miss. The clue is in the tracery of the nearest bay where the central panel is filled in with a single small hole in the middle. Below the arch, you can see an octagonal stone with an intriguing inscription carved into it. A mark like an arrowhead with the words Mary and Diaz on either side and alongside the ca characters five foot, 10 foot and 15 foot. On the wall opposite the arch is another engraving, a vertical line topped by the arrowhead mark, the words Mary and Diaz and the number 1829 and again, five foot, 10 foot and 15 foot. This is the meridian line that was drawn in 1829 by Mr. William Lloyd Wharton of Dryburn and Mr. Carr, then headmaster of Durham School. When the sun is near noon and thus almost directly opposite this aperture, the light which streams through the aperture forms a luminous image, which when the sun is high, as near midsummer, falls on the pavement, and when the sun is low, as near the winter solstice, falls on the opposite wall, similar to the Paris one. By observing the time of the first contact of the circular spot of light with the meridian line, and also the time of the last contact, and taking the mean, the instant of apparent noon can be ascertained very accurately. As far as I have found, this is the only church meridian in Britain. We now move on to Piscinas. Now the Piscina is essentially a small sink or drain head where liquid that has become in contact with the consecrated elements of communion can drain into consecrated ground. Usually these are mounted in the walls to the south of the altar, often with an ombre or cupboard above it. Floor piscinas are a rare form where the piscina simply takes the form of a hole in the floor. 
into which the washing up water can be poured directly into the floor at the end of the ablutions. In the 13th century slave church at Torpor is the simplest possible floor piscina. Close to the south wall of the chancel, a tapering square hole has been cut in the plank floor. Anything poured down it runs straight into the churchyard earth. A neat stopper ensures that when it is not in use, there is not a penetrating draught through the hole. Tacked up in a corner of the sanctuary steps is the floor piscina at Burnham Overy Church, Norfolk. It seems a little far from the altar, but as the church has seen an awful lot of remodelling, it's quite possible that a secondary altar stood here when this was new. Also in Norfolk, in St Mary's Church, Barton Bendish, which as well as the conventional 14th century piscina, has a double floor piscina in front of it, probably dating to the 13th century. They're very rare, but there are probably more that I haven't been able to find out about. Church floors are, of course, the home of many kinds of memorial. I can't hope to do more than skim over a very few examples just to give an idea of what can be found, or indeed missed. Commonest of all are the incised slabs, a type for which I have great affection, but are sadly undervalued. Some merely have inscriptions and tend to be totally ignored when churches are reordered, as with this early 18th century stone in Old Malton Priory, chopped off by the, by the Victorian parquet floor. Sometimes they can be very impressive. This huge black slab of elegant script, which occupies about a third of the chancel floor at Stonegrave Minster, commemorates Thomas Coomer, a rector of Stonegrave and Dean of Durham, who died in 1699 and was in his time a voluble defender of the Church of England. Some slabs show a figure of the deceased, crudely carved into the stone and often heavily worn, like this one in Howden Minster. If you look carefully, you can just see a gentleman in plate armour and his coat of arms. Others are deeply carved with the lines filled with contrasting composition, like this monument at Strelly in Nottinghamshire, to Sir Robert de Strelly, who died in 1438 and fought at Agincourt. Some do not lie flat with the floor surface and have their inscription carved onto the side of the slab like this armorial stone at Lead Lead, I never can remember which way it's pronounced. In Lancarfen Church is an incre intriguing incised slab. Stones incised with crosses are common during the medieval period, but tend to vanish after the Reformation. But this one is later, and dates from the 17th century. At the top it says, Here lieth the body of Robert David, 1628. But underneath is WR75 and a final date that looks like 1690 something. What makes the Lancarfen slab so interesting is it has a few lines of verse. My hope on Christ is fixed sure, who wounded was my soul's wounds to cure. WR. This is part of a poem scratched on a 17th century window from Carisbrook Castle by Charles I when he was a prisoner there. The line about Christ's wounds has a very medieval feel to it and the disembodied five wounds of Christ are common enough on late medieval tombs. But like the cross, this doesn't necessarily mean that Robert David, or the mysterious W.R., was a Catholic, as the wounds also figure in 18th century Med Methodist hymns. Incidentally, W.R. is quite possibly Robert David's son. At this period in Wales, they were still using patronymics, so W.R. is probably William or Walter Roberts, and simply Robert David's son. An unusual variant is this incised slab monument from Alsmore in Herefordshire, dating from 1392. These slabs were made roughly like brasses, but instead of sheets of brass, the workshop inlaid tiles of a mixture of chalk or lime with some sort of binder to form a rigid substance like white cement. Then the design was cut in and the lines were filled with coloured material. You can see they're using it in the shields as well as in the figures. Monumental brasses are often found as part of church floors. Some are tiny, like this minute 15th century brass to twin babies in Sheriff Hutton, while others are enormous, like this York-made brass to Sir John de Quintin and his wife Laura at Brands Burton. Few, however, were as enormous as the lost brass commissioned by the hugely unpopular Bishop of Durham, 
Louis de Beaumont, who purchased a vast slab of frostily marble, some 16 by 10 foot, had an enormously elaborate brass set in it, probably by a York marble in 1335, and had it set before the altar in the choir of Durham Cathedral. The slab is now just covered by that large piece of carpet in front of the altar. It gives you an idea of its scale. While individual brasses may be quite extensive, nothing really compares with the Chancel of Cobham in Kent, where 16 fine 13th and 14th century brasses form the equivalent of a carpet. Even wooden floors sometimes contain monuments, like this medieval burial marked on the wooden floor at Torpo in Norway. This memorial slab to Father Munoz de Zamora, who died in 1300, was one time, who was one time master of the Order of Preachers, is in the Basilica of Santa Sabina in Rome. Set into the floor, it makes use of mosaic and opera set tile to make a very striking impression. Much later, but hardly less impressive, are these beautiful mosaic and marble grave covers in the sanctuary of St. Robert's Church panel. I don't know how many have actually ever gone and had a look at them. They are really rather lovely. <laughs> this intriguing inscription lies at the back of St. Mary's Church in Cobham, the one with the br brasses up in the chancel, where the, church warden and I, where the church warden and I are standing. It consists of a strip of black marble slabs with an inscription defining the burial ground of the Hayes family. It does seem to have got very muddled up, though, probably during the carving. I suspect the carver received a draft on slips of paper and dropped one while he was working. When he realised his mistake, he made the best of a bad job and fitted it in somehow or other. All the right words, not necessarily in the right order. It reads, this ground between the two marbles, north, and the burial place of the family of Hayes, of Ule, Ulet, in the parish, containing 20 foot in breadth and 14 feet in length west of this border is. Disentangled, it reads, this ground between the two marbles containing 20 foot in breadth and 14 foot in length, north and west of this border, is the burial place of the family of Hayes of Ulrich in this parish. I may add, the church warden, who had been all her life worshipping at this church, had never noticed it and was thoroughly intrigued by it. And finally, inside the late 11th century church in Yelling in Denmark, set among the grave mounds of Viking kings, is a spectacular modern floor, part of an overall decorative scheme completed in 2000. Close by the church once stood a wooden church erected by Harold Bluetooth in 957 over the remains of his father, Gorm the Old. In the 1970s, the remains of the earlier church were excavated and the remains of Gorm were retrieved and buried in the stone church, so that once more, the church at Yelling was a royal burial church. The modern floor marks the spot of Gorm's burial in the chancel with this small insert of fine silver into the black stone inlay of the floor. Now there's a monument that you, you blink, you miss it. But it's really rather lovely. And now we move on to a few, few oddities, miscellaneous things. <coughs> Photographing the Saxon throne at Hexham Abbey, our eyes were drawn to the handsome wooden grating beyond it. And being me, I wanted to know what was under it. A kindly volunteer guide asked if we'd like to take a look and help me open the heavy oak doors. At the foot of the ladder that you could just see, stood the excavated foundations of the apse of Wilfrid's original church. Less dramatically, earlier foundations are revealed under the floor at St Peter's Shaftesbury. Other holes in the floor are more useful and often decorative, like these heating grills at Felixkirk. Very handsome, though not as effectual as one would like, are these splendid ones by the door of Stonegrave Minster. Visiting Stonegrave in the weeks before Christmas, it's the first time I've ever been where, on a snowy night, we stood in the porch waiting for somebody to let us in, and it was quite chilly. They, he eventually came, opened the door, and a blast of cold air nearly filled us. The heating had by then been on for some hours. An improvised but efficient repair to an elderly heating grill in Lentwater in church in Herefordshire. I loved that. It works. They'll presumably eventually replace it with something a bit more elegant, but it works. And clearly the heating system at Sherburn and Elmwood is efficient as well as decorative. When we visited, we found a pew reserved for the church cat. 
In it were an ice basket, a litter tray, and food and water bowls. That's a cat who's come found the right place. And while we're on the subject of church cats, one strolled across this medieval tile at Wormleys and St Mary before it dried out. That's cats for you. Yeah. Now spot the deliberate mistake in the tiled floor of Studley Royal. Why this was done is unclear. Maybe a memory of the deliberate mistakes in Islamic art. Only God makes things perfectly. If you look, there should be a patterned tile here. Instead, it's here. <laughs> A very different tile floor is this 2015 one entitled Walking on Water in the Roman Catholic Church of St Boniface in Zandem in Holland. The old tile floor was in need of repair, so it was decided to mark out an area at the back of church that could be used for welcoming events, meetings and activities and would focus on baptism. So it would be distinct while still blending into the Gothic Revival building. I think it's amazing. An intriguing art installation photographed in 2016 is Our Colour Reflection by Liz West in St John's Church, Scunthorpe. It's a redundant church which is now an art centre. I think it makes the church unusable but it's incredibly effective. The sounds of 150 mechanical seesaws striking in the floor of a church in Austria reverberate round its nave in this installation by the Swiss artist Simon. The artist used wood to build 150 simple seesaws made from long battles that pivot vertically on short upright lengths, powered by small electric motors. Oriented in different directions, they're scattered round the nave and transepts of this Gothic church in the Austrian town of Krems am Donau. Don't ask me what it's supposed to signify. In St Peter's Rome, the measurements of the world's largest Christian churches are inserted in brass letters on the nave floor. St Peter's itself, St Paul's Cathedral and Westminster Abbey all feature in the markers. The, the, the markers serve to, as a reminder of the universality of the church and help visitors to appreciate the size of St Peter's. Sometimes the ground immediately outside churches holds curiosities. This photograph is taken, not by me, from the roof of the west end of St Peter's Rome. Surrounding the base of the obelisk is a marked out circular area containing a double ring between which are equidistant dots. When you look at these dots, you find they're marble panels with the wind direction marked on them. This is a windrose, which can be used to establish the direction from which the wind is blowing. The windrose as an idea has been around since ancient times, but these markers were added to the square about 1852, when Pius IX added the four seven branch candelabra with fountains and the traffic-free circle inside the 68 short granite posts. If you look carefully, you will see running across the road junction of the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, at Abbey Strand, a number of S-shapes. These mark the boundary of the religious sanctuary provided by, from, from civil law by Holyrood Abbey. Those seeking asylum were principally debtors, known jokingly to the locals as the Abbey Lairds. Applications for sanctuary had to be made to the Bailey of Holyrood and a booking fee paid, once accepted, letters of protection were issued, which allowed applicants to live free from the threat, threat of arrest within the sanctuary zone. As a result, a small industry built up to service those granted sanctuary, such as inns providing food and accommodation. Interestingly, because legal proceedings were not allowed in Scotland on Sundays, those granted asylum were able to leave the sanctuary zone unmolested for 24 hours from midnight each Saturday night. In 1880, however, a change in the law meant that debtors could no longer be imprisoned. And as, as a result, the need for people to seek sanctuary effectively ended. An easily missed but moving oddity is this pattern of holes drilled into the floor of the First African Baptist Church in Savannah. Founded in 1773, First African is the oldest black church in North America. The enslaved American Af African American builders who worked at night by torchlight told the whites the pattern of those holes was an African symbol carved by the slaves. As far as this went, this was true. The holes in the floor are the shape of an African prayer symbol known as a Congolese cosmogram or flash of the spirits, which represents birth, life, death and rebirth. However, the real purpose of these little circles was to be the breathing holes over a void used to hide runaway slaves. 
Four feet under that basement floor is another finished subfloor. Runaways hid between the floors until they could be smuggled to the north. The arrival of COVID-19 has made yet another difference to church floors, with spacing and one-way flows clearly marked in sticky tape. And on the subject of tape, finally, when you visit Stonegrave Minster, do look where you tread. The amount of hazard tape marking different levels and pipes is stunning. And there we are, the end. I hope you now will see floors in a new light and find them as fascinating as I do. <laughs>